So if Jim could only have one rifle, I was going to ask that question. That's a good and question. And it have one of his barrels, and what caliber and length would it be? I'll go check inventory and see how many we have if one before you answer that. <laughs> yeah, what do we need to sell? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're going to get shot with... You know what's going on there? What's yeah, right I, I, from the other side. It's an H-E-B, man. Yeah. Indestructible. Christ. Man. So we're working on a tool. Uh, there we go. We're working on a little tool between. Uh, not this. Oh. That's an Atwood. Oh. Okay. People collect those things like it's. They're going out of style, but Shane King and I um, are really Shane King more than I. <laughs> I just give him some inspiration on it. But uh, uh, want to make them domestically here. That's what uh, I was gonna. Be, that's what I was wondering. Out of a good alloy, you know, S30V type of stuff, and um, but you know, something you can still put on a keychain, maybe a little bit longer. Put in a little Kydex thing and keep it in your kit. Mm -hmm. Strap it to your sling or whatever. Uh, but something that is good quality. It's a nice gift to a good customer or whatever. Um, but it's also one that you don't really feel the pain because there's not, they're not going to be cheap, but they're not going to be like horribly expensive, you know? Mm -hmm. So kind of a pay it forward type of thing for whatever. And we've, uh, he's got some, some prints drawn up that we, I, lo I looked at a couple of weeks ago and it looks real promising, really simple, kind of a pry thing. Maybe a little bit of a blade to open boxes with, um, an alligator type of wrench system. When we talk about oh, alligator, yeah. for the different uh, right, half inch for your badger mounts and all that kind of poop. That'd be pretty cool. No, no, for sure. I've been wanting to do that for years, man. Something super simple like that is cool. Is that something we can leave in the podcast, or would mm -hmm. you need to take it out? Hey. Keep it in. So you heard it here first, everybody. <laughs> yeah. So Shane, get get on it, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you're under, under pressure now. <laughs> well, Jim, yeah. thank you for coming up, seeing us today. I had to, dude. I know. You had to come up. got business and, to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'll let you roll this one in because this is the one, I think, when we first sat down and talked about the BTO podcast, the first guest on the list Oh, I got you guys buffaloed. <laughs> was Jim Hodge. That was the first guy. And now here we are, nine months into it. Yeah. We finally got him. We finally got it. Well, I've been up here a few times. Yeah, I just hadn't hadn't made the time to sit down. We've well, been it's busy. not that I did. Y'all like, never invited me. It's like you're busy or something. Trying to get three people, four people schedules that are all very busy. If, if you would have showed up yesterday, none of us would have had time. Well, here's the crazy thing is, you know, I am busy, but, you know, I have a, I'm busy doing Hodge Defense stuff. I've got other thing, obligations, you know, business-wise to do, but, you know, my family is still super important. So spending time with my, my beautiful wife and my children, you know, that supersedes everything else, you know, for the most part. So, yeah, I'd, sometimes, it, you know, people used to ask me, why do you like to take road trips in your car, right? And I used to, man. I used to drive to Fort Benning and back, uh, wherever I had meetings in my car, or even up to D.C. And I was like, guys, you know what? Why don't you just fly? And I'm like, sometimes I like not being busy and getting into my car, you know, driving at night where there's no traffic on the road. It's just me, the road, maybe some talk radio, and uh, <laughs> not having to worry about juggling 722 phone calls and text messages and so that is my downtime. But uh, anyway. Well, we appreciate you. You bet. For sure. And on that note, welcome to the Big Tech's Ordinance Podcast. I'm Ike. We have Chris and Ian. And our guest today, Jim Hodge of Hodge Defense. Wherever so. the cameras are. <laughs> <laughs> Doing the Ricky Bobby thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to do with my hands. Uh, no, but th thank you for, for coming on today. We've been really excited to have you. So, um, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, 
who's Jim Hodge, uh, as much as you can say? And Well, I mean, it's, uh, I'm the owner of Hodge Defense Systems. Uh, we've been in business for 10 years. Uh, we had our 10th anniversary in February. Nice. We're a really small company. Um, you know, when I first started this, I wanted to be a huge company. Uh, timing is everything in this industry. And sometimes you go down a path and you think, okay, yeah, I want to do all this. But, you know, the boss upstairs leads you in a direction and says, no, I'm going to direct you to this direction. And which is more, we, we, we're not a custom shop. Uh, I wouldn't even call us boutique because um, boutique implies a lot of custom stuff. But uh, we're just small, and, and we, 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 we don't uh, bite off more than we can chew. And I, I like it that way. Um, I don't like talking about myself too, too much, but only because I'm shy that way. But, um, you know, I started off life uh, in law enforcement, um, then went to contracting overseas, and uh, uh, always been fascinated with the, car, the carbine and, you know, tinkered with it, been doing it for 25 years or so. And, um, you know, it got to a point to where I've, I've had a lot of involvement in other companies and uh, worked with a lot of big names, you know, just kind of as, you know, not really being paid, but just as more of, you know, at the time it was like, Eight companies, not 280 companies. Um, helped some f a few people out, and my wife is like, "Hey, rather than you traveling so much, why don't you stay home and uh, chase me around the house, than chasing bad guys overseas, <laughs> and um, um, do for yourself what you've done for other folks?" So that's really kind of how it started. Uh, it was super mom and pop, still kind of is. Um, even the logo was picked by my kids. Nice. You know? nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I I did a bunch of diagrams of logos, and um, my kids obviously were 10 years younger. And uh, one Saturday morning, still kind of playing on my iPad, iPad in bed, you know, they're, they're, they're watching cartoons with my wife and I. I'm like, all right, which one do you guys like? And they both picked the same one and said, all right, that's the logo. <laughs> but uh, that's, you know, it, I, I've been blessed. Um, and... Um, you know, we've we've had steady growth um, and uh, we, but it's incre incremental growth. So that's a little bit how Hodge Defense got started. Nice. I know originally like the mod two was kind of. That's that's what a lot of people are drawn to with mm -hmm. the exotic alloys and all that. Mm -hmm. So it started off. So a, a friend of mine um, told me about aluminum lithium and how Alcoa was trying to break into the firearms market and um, with little success. And at the time, you know, starting out my company, I, you know, I knew people in the industry, but from a material supply perspective, you know, I didn't know anyone. And um, aluminum lithium, uh, we were the first people to actually use aluminum lithium. Um, there's two variations. We were extruding an aluminum lithium in 2099 and then forging it in 2055. Um, and that was a task because the density of the alloy. And it's hard enough to extrude 7075 for rails. And that's, again, kind of how the process of rails began as a, by an extrusion. And, um, and it was super, super expensive. Um, so we abandoned that, went to 7075 rails, but forging the uppers and forging the lowers, creating the dyes that were that can handle the the type of alloy we were wanting to forge um, was fairly easy enough. Though um, the process of forging our first uh, forgings in aluminum lithium were coming from Alcoa, or I call it Defense, and like like the the creators of the pyramid of Giza, right? People always ask, well, you know, they lost that technology. Well, Alcoa Defense hadn't forged receivers in a long time. So we're thrusting them back into forging receivers, and they kind of went through another learning process of forging. And it took us a year just to get forgings right. We had, you know, from, from a surface perspective. 
And that's where the rune rocks came from, is they were originally blooms. Um, and, you know, they're crazy. You know, people go crazy for them now, but uh, uh, they were originally blooms, and we fought that for a long time. Uh, aluminum, lithium, uh, how we secured the material for forgings was usually on the coattails of another defense company that was using it for whatever, so they would have extra stock. Um, because of supply chain management and things like that, it was always kind of hit and miss on our accessibility to aluminum lithium. So one of the engineers that I was working with at Alcoa had moved to another um, aluminum company, and I'm like, all right, if you were king for the day, you know, if you weren't going to use aluminum lithium, where would you go? And basically he said for C405. Now, aluminum lithium... Uh, again, because of the density of the alloy, was also always hard to anno, to get a hard anno on it. The anno would take, but the pigment wouldn't. And we ended up seeing a cull rate. Of, if I'm going to do 100 receivers, I'm probably getting 90 back, because they would they were hard to anodize. It was a difficult process. Uh, where C405 made it much easier, even though they were still a denser alloy. So we made that transition to C405. The difference between C405 and aluminum lithium, aluminum lithium is a little bit lighter. C405 is just a little bit stronger. But same mass to weight ratio is a 7075. And that's kind of how we transitioned into C405. So that was actually my next question. So, like, you know, you're using the C405 now for the Mod 2s. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people want to know why. what makes C405 better than 7075. Well, it's just a stronger alloy. You know, I mean, it, it's... It, would you, if you had the option to get something that was, that had a better material, would you not get it? Stronger, you know? stronger material, but with the same same weight. Um, yeah, stronger material, but with the same weight. And it is quite a bit more expensive. Oh um, yeah. But so on the on the mod twos, it's not just a standard mill spec forging. It is forged. It's not billet. No, correct. Um, you have your own dies for that. Yeah, yeah. We have our own dies. Uh, they were expensive. Um. Because of the way they had to be made originally for the aluminum lithium. So you can't just go call up Sarah and be like, hey, I need right. I need 500 of these. Right. They're your dyes, your yep. specific forging. Yeah. Yep. They're and unique it, to me. You have a little bit more mass on there, too. Yeah, we have a uh, on the upper um, about an extra 30 seconds of, of wall thickness, uh, for lack of better words. Uh, so you got a stronger material and a little bit more mass. And a stronger manufacturing process, forging versus yeah. billet. And so they're, you know, where the rubber meets the road on a lot of this is in the upper, um, the consistency of an upper. And that's where I really wanted to focus. As a matter of fact, you know, on lowers, I, I'm now considering going back to 70, 75 on the lowers. It's just, is it better? Yes. If we were to stay with C, I'm still weighing the options of that. Um, but it's not as crucial in the lower as it would be the upper. Uh, and that would also, you know, we'd pass those savings on to the consumer. Um, because, again, the material is, you know, 400% more just in raw material. Yeah. You know, it's four times the price. Let's talk about barrels. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of where the magic happens, or at least one of the spots. Um, how did you come up with, 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 your, with your profile for the barrel and that whole process? Well, I, I knew what I wanted, but I, again, I'm not an engineer, man. I'm just a... You're a trigger puller. Uh, well, you know, a, a good idea of fairy. Um, <laughs> I knew what I wanted in, in the way of a balance of a barrel, so I, I came up with a, a certain taper. Um, at the time, uh, Daniel Defense and I were working together together. Uh, still have a great relationship and, I, and I'm super blessed to have really good relationships across the industry. Uh, I'm not an island. I'll work with anyone and not to be horse that way, but you know, uh, I, I learn from other folks. I still learn every day, uh, on how to do a better weapon. But <clears throat> at the time I was using Danny D barrels and they were great barrels and they still are great barrels. Um, we were awarded the set program by the United States army uh, which SEP is Soldier Enhancement Program. Um, there's only been a couple other guns that's ever won it, and that was the Barrett 107 and the Mark 110, and then us. 
on the Mod 2. And uh, long and short of it, um, FN got smelt that blood in the water and uh, wanted to pull me away, so they did. And we talked about barrels. Um, I can, kind of gave them what I envisioned in a profile uh, and the material. And they were already doing barrels for a couple other companies and that 240 barrel, barrel steel, which is machine gun grade barrel steel. It's just a high vandium content alloy. And um, I had asked for a couple other processes that they didn't use for other OEM clients. They thought I was crazy because they said this is going to cost you more money and it disrupts our assembly process um, and your coal rate's going to be higher. I'm like, I don't give a damn. Just do it. Long and short of it, we did it. And after extensive testing through FN, um, we have the barrel. Um, as a matter of fact, they license the barrel from me, even though they make it for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Right? Everyone's like, you must have had a really good attorney. I'm like, no, man. It just happened that way. Well, you do have a really good attorney. I do. In case Griff is watching. This. Yeah, hey, Griff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's sometimes we all get a little lucky, you know, again, I'm not, you know, I'm not gun Jesus by any stretch of the imagination, but, uh, I know what I want and uh, I don't give a damn how much it costs. Um, and that can sometimes bite me in the butt because my stuff is expensive. Uh, and it's expensive to the consumer because it's, it's expensive for me. And if I was doing a run of thousands and thousands and thousands of barrels, you know, it would come down in price a little bit. But I'm not that company, you know, as we discussed before. Um, well, well, we didn't. We You mentioned it before. And this is going to bring me back to that question because I've been waiting to an ask it. <laughs> what What was the driving point to for you to decide small batch high quantity high quality high qu quality correct small batch high quality versus becoming a larger manufacturer money money i mean the infrastructure required to be a larger manufacturer and vertically integrated is insane and uh, San Antonio's, you know, labor pool is mas meno from some San Antonio. You know what that means. Um, but, uh, you know, it just kind of happened that way, kind of by accident. Um, uh, and as if anyone doesn't know, already know, you guys here are my operations folks. So you're doing all my forecasting and ordering. And I'm probably the best business move I've ever made is to get in bed with you jokers but um uh i would only spend what can i what i can afford to do i've never leveraged any debt never had an underwriter or a sugar daddy you know <laughs> just did it absolutely financially organic doesn't make me doesn't make a guy rich believe me uh but you know I wanted to build the company organically, and this was the only way that I can control the amount of financial output for the input of product and sales. Um, and, you know, if it was only building 50 receivers at a time, that's what I can afford to do and write a check for it. That's what I did. Um, so just kind of being frugal, not so much frugal with my money, but not taking enormous risk or having oversight of a um, a board or an investment company I just literally did it with my checkbook yeah being smart and being safe safe about it you well, don't answer anybody at that point either, yeah you know yeah well I, do, I don't and it gives me the freedom mm -hmm. um to do what i need to do uh, i do work with big companies now uh there's a lot of folks out there that you know use our ip um which is always good, a little bit better mailbox money, but again, not making me a whole lot of money. And um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I see Hodge Defense continuing to grow kind of at our snail's pace, but 
I think it builds a stronger foundation as the years go by. You're definitely able to be more flexible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And agile. Yeah. I mean, for whatever reason, if this administration was to get crazy with um, assault weapon ban, you know, I can close my books right now and wouldn't have to write a check to anyone. Um, not that I'm going to, but we're involved in too many other government projects that um, it would keep us, you know, they would keep us around for that. But it's it's getting harder and harder to be a manufacturer, for sure. Yeah, I know the administration right now, or the ATF under this current administration, are a lot more, um, there's been a lot more FFL license revocations than there have been in years past. Like uh, talking to one of the, the, the one of the examiners that came by, they said, like, used to be, like, you'd have these infractions that were just, like, a little warning. Like, hey, like, you know, this stuff kind of this kind of stuff happens. Now it's revocations. Like, they're they're not playing around anymore. And, and you, when you do the numbers that I do, it's harder to mess up. Yeah, like, I, I know we had an audit, and we had a couple. There's a couple errors. Like, the, 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 it was, the caliber was 5.56 by 45, and we had 5.56 NATO. Like, stuff like that. And, you know, it ended there's a handful of them but it wasn't as big of a deal because we had so many transactions um so it wasn't as big of a deal because they look at it as like a percentage but if you're only doing like you know five or six hundred entries a year and you have five mistakes you know that's as a percentage that's a lot higher than right five well, or six mistakes that and i don't do any 4473s yeah that's that's where a lot of the revocations are coming from well i'm not set up that way right i'm not a public place to to go in and say, hey, we're going to transfer a gun. Yeah. 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 We're a manufacturer. And really, it's kind of almost brokering the manufacturing now. And, you know, the, the serialized items still come through me and they get transferred out. Okay. And it's it keeps everything super clean and, you know, super honest. Yeah, we, we do the same here. We even if I was going to buy a lower today, we would transfer the lower to the range. Right. I would go over there to where they do. 50 transfers in a, you know i mean they don't i don't think they do 50 transfers in a day but you know they do Ten, that's what they do yeah. you know like they have all the infrastructure set up like all the processes and balance checks and balances so, so yeah we definitely we, understand we don't that. mess with 44 yeah, no. at the warehouse anyways um the uh if we could jump back to the barrels thing mm -hmm. the uh the one thing that always caught my eye was how many rounds dudes are getting out of your barrels like you know mark smith and bill blowers like what, 40, 50,000 rounds out of their rifles is mind-blowing. And, you know, I know Mark just retired his pretty recently. and, and y'all like 40 plus, I believe. Yeah, and, you know, and the only reason he retired it, I mean, it was still still had life in it. It was still a usable rifle. He's like, yeah, it just, you know, wasn't shooting the groups that I wanted. But it wasn't, like, keyholing. It, it was, you <laughs> know, it, it, it went from a, a you know, a sub-MOA rifle to a two-MOA rifle. And it's, he's like, nah, you know what, I'm going to, Time for an upgrade, but it's that, that's that's wild to me. Well, you can destroy one of my barrels in 500 rounds if you wanted to. I mean, it's just it's how you do it, right? And um, you know, it, it's it's maintenance, it's cadence, ammo, it's you know the cool down in between. Um, it's hard for me to say, oh yeah, we built a 40,000 round barrel. Because I don't know how you're going to shoot it. Yeah, for sure. You just roll that selector over and it's just <laughs> bap, bap, <laughs> suppressed with hot ammo. See a barrel. Yeah. Um, you're going to destroy any barrel that way. Ours, you know, that's part of our, our process, part of our our shtick mm -hmm. in a way. Um, and that's why our barrels are, are pricey. Um, but you also look at it through the lenses of, 40,000 rounds back in the day, right, when ammo was tough, that's $40,000 of ammo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And oh, uh, now it's $20,000 mm -hmm. of ammo. I yeah. mean, like that's. When we bought ammo yesterday, it was 53 cents a round. Right. For uh, 77 grain, five, but, and five, five, six. But the barrels were originally uh, designed for Alpha 1 ammunition, which was a higher pressure at the time. They've since lowered the pressure a little bit. But uh, at the time, it was designed for Alpha-1 ammunition, suppressed. And that's where kind of the anemic ports came in. I like running anemic ports. It may not be for everyone's climate, but, um, 
you know, it's easier to open a port than than close one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> definitely can can't it. close it. <laughs> Shove it full of Play-Doh. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, um, uh, I, I just wanted to build the most robust barrel. And here's here's the deal, kids. Uh, I'm not done with barrel stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, as you guys may or may not know, uh, I'm working on a couple of programs just getting to that next level. Um, and you, you can be like, hey, that barrel is a $400 barrel. That barrel is a $500 barrel. If you don't ever have to replace a barrel, but if you're replacing $68 barrels, well, that's no big deal. I mean, it it's all comes out in the wash, but if you don't ever want to have to replace it, that's my goal, right, is to get a longer-lasting gobstopper. Um, and for those that don't need it, cool. For those who do, cool. Yeah. yeah, that's one thing I've always appreciated. You've never been like, you have to buy this. Like, if you don't, if if you don't choose Hodge Defense, then you you don't care. It's always been a like, I'm gonna build a better mousetrap, or like, I'm I'm gonna make it the best I can. And if if that if that works for you, cool. If not, then shoot shoot what you want. You know? Yeah, no, it's absolutely. Not. There's a gun for everybody out there. You know, responsible person out there. Um, there is. There's a gun for everyone out there, and. And if and if all you can do is big because of accessibility, financial means, or your know, your maturity, not in uh, a mental way, but in a gun ownership way, um, you know, has reached a certain point. You know, it there's you know it, there's nothing wrong with a Colt sixty nine twenty. It it'll do the job. It'll do the job well. That's uh, true. But if you're instructing and you're putting bazillions and bazillions of rounds down and you want to enhance this, that, or the other, well, mid-gas systems, free float systems, enhanced triggers, all these little things add up to something that's a little bit more uh, user-friendly and uh, really what it boils down to is consistency. And um, all the small increments make a, a major improvement. And that's again going back to the barrels and uh, the metallurgy. That's that's my my goal. It may 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 or may not make sense to some. Uh, to me, it does. And my name's on the side of the gun, so <laughs> you got something to say about it? How it turns out? Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you think this is one of those universe questions here on uh, on it? I've been I've been part of this industry for going on f- close to 14 years in some way, shape, or form, whether it just be training, running a training company, instructing, or anything. But the the level of you know back 15 years ago, if you got a off the shelf AR that was sub two MOA, that was a pretty good gun. Mm-hmm. And now the standard is oh this you know I paid. Seventeen hundred dollars for this it was better be sub MOA gun. I'm like, bro, <laughs> like 10, 15 years ago, you were having to spend way more money to get that accuracy standard out of a rifle. What do you think has led into that at this point? Technology and ammunition, uh, technology and manufacturing. Uh, it's easier to hit more finite. Deltas and and spec. Um, you know, it's not just one thing. It's not just the barrels. It's you know ammunition. It's more people are shooting. More people know how to shoot accurately. Yeah. Um, it's the optical devices. You know, I mean, think about when low power variables became a thing. Now you got a low power variable on your gun. Gives you a little bit more magnification, gives you a little bit more precise aiming deal. You're going to see the accuracy improve rather than shooting a two MOA dot or a three MOA dot, yeah. which guns in the past could have shot pretty well. I've I've got some old ass Colts, uh, and I got a lot of them um, that <laughs> yeah, shoot <laughs> that shoot that shoot really really well, but they would maybe not have known it that it shot pretty well um, because there wasn't. We weren't thinking about putting a one to six or one to eight, yeah, or you know, a two to ten, which is my new kind of favorite scope from Loophole. 
um, you know, the ability is there to be more accurate and more consistent, going back to consistency and more consistent. So, you know, it's not just one systemic thing in the way of, oh, barrels have gotten better. Again, it's this kind of a hodgepodge of multiple things. The shooter, ammo, gun, training. You want to talk about rails for a minute? Mm -hmm. Kind of. So the wedge lock is kind of where, kind of where it started. You mm -hmm. want to walk us through the history of that and all the, the backstory on that? So I was using another brand's rail when I first um, started, and you know, good brand, good rails. But uh, I always, when I, if you look at a carbine, um, one of the most discriminating things that you see in it, in the way of okay. That's different. I can identify a knight's gun because mm -hmm. it's got a knight's rail. I can identify a Daniel Defense gun because it's got a DD rail on it, and so on. I needed my own rail. Um, I approached Mike Miller, uh, at who was the owner of his Mega at the time, and said, hey, I want to build a rail. Sent him some drawings on what I wanted to do, um, and he liked it. Um, and we, just started, we started really talking about lockup. And it was important for me um, to have the most sturdy rail because that's when I first was introduced into drop tests and destruction testing of, of guns. It's like, oh, shit, man, we really need to make something robust here. Uh, and that's why all my wedge locks were 70-75. Never done a 60-60 one. one. Not that there's anything wrong with it. It's just it was designed to be 7,000 series. And um, they helped me a lot with the, the lockup system. Um, the external of that rail is predominantly 99.99% me. Uh, and I would say the lockup is about 80% or more them. And um, we did it together. So the Mega Wedge Lock and the Hodge Wedge Lock came out at the same time. And um, it's always funny <laughs> uh, for all those guys that are listening. You, you know, sometimes you design something and you're like, man, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then after a couple of months of production, it's like, oh, man, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have done this. And the wedge lock um, did have those. And one of them was, again, I love the feel, but proximity to barrel, it gets a little warm. And then you have proximity to gas block, mm -hmm. which you have to be very careful on how you mount your M-lock accessories. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that... Um, I was approached by the Maneuver Center and FN kind of concurrently about developing a rail because the, the wedge lock was an expensive rail to make. It was almost 100% machined on the exterior. Um, so machine time equals money. Um, to make something a little bit more reasonable and then that can handle, a, you know, 40 millimeter grenade launcher at the bottom and still be free floated. So the pinch lock came. So the things that I learned with the S lock I mean, I'm sorry, the wedge lock, uh, I applied to the pinch lock with something a little bit more robust. Um, I knew I wasn't doing it in the 7000 series, so made it a little bit beefier to, to compensate uh, for the density of the alloy or the strength of the alloy. And, um, um, you know, that's kind of where the whole rail transition it was the wedge then the pinch and i was super satisfied with the pinch um it's where i wanted to be and then the s came and it's ironic because the s lock and the pinch lock even the wedge lock uses the same barrel nut mm -hmm. and i wanted to keep that and that way you can have sub assemblies already done and you slide on whatever rail you wanted but the lockup system and the pinch and the s are the same and i wanted to kind of split the uprights between a wedge and a pinch to create the S. And that stands for spine. Um, so we have more material in the 12 o'clock position of the rail, um, which tends to add or maintains bearing surface, a little bit more bearing surface on the barrel nut um, with less flex. Um, and uh, But that's how kind of the rails got started. And, and ironically enough, the S, even though we had a lockup system, took more time to develop than any other rail. It was just the outside of it. And then developing it to make it machinable. 
and repeatable. Um, sometimes you get lucky on things, and sometimes you got to make sacrifices. So there's the real story. So on the pinch, I know that, I don't know how much you can talk about, but I know that has had a lot of testing done on that particular rail. And the S. And the S. Um, how much can you talk about? And So, yeah. Um, massive drop testing, temperature testing, impact testing, uh, flex testing, um, third party, uh, multiple third parties um, to include the government. Um, and, uh, an exorbitant amount of money has been spent on that. That's what I can say. <laughs> <laughs> and which is, I'm lucky, you know, it wasn't money out of my pocket yeah. <laughs> because I can't afford that kind of testing because that stuff gets expensive. Yeah. Super fast. I mean, people think about testing is like, oh, let's just chuck it across the room and see if it'll work out for us. And that, I, that, I guess that is a way, but there's no consistency in it. So yeah. all the testing has been done with engineers and, you know. Dare I say, hundreds of thousand dollars worth of instrumentation and high speed video, and uh, you know, it's not Bill in his backyard yeah. with his. No, you know. no, it's it's not fixtures. I mean, it's fixtures. You know, dropping it on at certain heights for consistencies at different angles and simulated weights. With it's not just a naked gun either. It's a gun with a full mag, an optic, a light, a laser, a sling, even. Um, you know, multiple angles to include muzzle, butt, sides, angular sides, uh, on both sides. And, and funny, the, the last time we did the S-lock, we were working on a project uh, for someone in Europe. And um, it was during COVID, so we had to uh, video all of our testing, all of our drop testing. And so we did our drop test. It's like, oh, thank God that's done. We're looking at the gun going, all right, what broke? Nothing. But uh, the guy comes back and said, shit, I forgot to press the record button. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> we had to do it all again in the same gun. And uh, so, yeah, that, that damn S-lock has been, it's been tested pretty thoroughly. We understand that. We've made it 15 minutes in the podcast one time, and I was yeah. like, uh... <laughs> We're not recording audio, so we're going to have to go back. So I, think his, I think his beats your story. Yeah, I know. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but sure. again, it goes it, it goes back to, you know, creating an idea, which is awesome for anyone to do. That I love that kind of spirit in a person. Um, but testing it that's non-bias with professional testers not just, again, running it over with a vehicle. Um, th that's where the rubber meets the road. And, and to do that, it takes a lot of money. I mean, you start testing barrel and barrel life. You think about the, the labor that goes involved in shooting it on a range, under video or under high-speed cameras, mm -hmm. and then the amount of ammunition, and then the sustainment of that firearm during its testing. You know, if you're doing it for 20,000 rounds and you're doing it within, let's call it four or five days, you know, that's labor. You can't just have one guy shooting it at the same time. You know, you're going to have, you employ a team of testers to do it. Um, and that's one thing I've, I've always cherished and I really appreciate with uh, some of the folks I've worked with in the way of they've thrown the money at it and um, they believe in it. And, um, I get to reap the benefits of it. Pretty cool, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So what's um so what if you can talk about it, what are some of the who are some of the companies that use your your rail designs at this point? Just go on the internet and look. I mean there's there's six companies out there. And those are sixty sixty one though on yeah. the edges. Yeah. They don't make those out of a seven series. Mm -mm. We we main can we maintain other than FN they use the, and I can say this because they use the name in marketing. Uh, they use the wedges and the pinches. We maintain pinch. We maintain S. Uh, Suns uh, uses our extrusion on S, uh, and a different lockup. Um, and um, 
you know, there are multiple companies out there using the wedge design. Um, and I've moved on. Um, you know, we had a meeting the other day mm-hmm. about uh, possibly, and don't freak out everybody, <laughs> uh, getting some more 7,000 series uh, wedge locks to the guys, and maybe we'll do them in TI. Don't freak out. Um, but You just broke the internet, Jim. <laughs> you realize that. Um, but we would do a limited run. And it's just they're expensive to do, and it's a good rail. It really is a great rail. Um, but uh, just to kind of please the the commercial sector, I do care about them. Some people don't think I do, but I, I really do. They're, they're paying the bills too. And I know historically kind of feeding into that, like <clears throat> kind of what you you – you've you do a lot of like, like contracts and stuff and mm-hmm. a lot of – you know, for special, for special, um, customers. Um, and then kind of the commercial market hasn't really been your focus. No, they have, um, it's, you know, because I'm small and agile. Um, I used to say a lot, I used to say no a lot more to contracts. Um, because of you guys, I don't have to say no as much, right? Cause I have the infrastructure now. And uh, I've always been bashful about bringing too many people on and trying to manage it all by myself. You know, we've, we've had a relationship for two years now. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the eight years prior, I did it all by myself, man, by myself, to include cleaning toilets. And, um, you know, it, it, because of me not saying no, we're... I don't need to tell you. I don't even know why you'd ask that question because you're involved in it too, guys. Um, yeah, we, we've been blessed. Uh, we're, we're being asked a lot more. People are... We, we've been fortunate to have um, um, some brand recognition um, within certain units, and now we're... Now more than ever, let me rephrase that, we're executing on deliverables to them and competing on programs um, and uh, with the su- with success and uh, but, but my focus isn't really just solely them it's still a consumer I, 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 I love them very much and but it, we are a company that really we build a combative rifle for professionals and I believe and I may be wrong, but I believe when you when you get into this game, you have to make a decision. There's a it, you you can have your cake and eat it too. Though, when you're designing things, do you design it for the masses or do you design it as a combative system? And what I mean by that is even rail flex or durability or longevity. We go back to barrel talking about barrels. A barrel can last forty thousand rounds versus a barrel that only lasts six or seven thousand rounds. Um, you know, who's going to have the money to dump that kind of Yeah, who, who training? spends $20,000, $30,000 on ammo to right. be able to shoot out that barrel? Right. Um, so, that again, that's the kind of approach I've taken. And the consumer gets to benefit from that kind of, that kind of OCD uh, that was originally established for the government markets. Yeah. And we're, we're putting out more stuff to the commercial market now more than mm-hmm. ever like there's there's mm-hmm. barrels you can go buy a barrel right now dude i can't tell you, you how many rails. times i go when can i get this and when can i get that and you know god bless all you people that ask that uh soon enough but you know we do put product out it just it sells so fast and again i'm blessed for it uh or we're blessed for it and uh it just sells really fast and we, we, we you know we can only make what we can make and, but and still be prudent. Yeah, I mean, like, if you put an order in for right now for something, like, it'll be months, if not multiple months, like 6, 8, 10, 18 months sometimes before you'll see what you've ordered when you're like, hey, I want this. Well, like, right? so for Mod 2, kind of to give folks a little bit of insight into the manufacturing process. So, like, we put an order in for four jeans way last year hell we're buying the material yeah we're buying the material before it's even (laughs) preformed for a forge and then it's preformed for a forge then it gets forged then it goes to manufacturing right or 
machining. Yeah. So we're that far into, uh, I guess, our supply chain management. A lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. yeah. And it's it, that's not that's something okay. that happens over overnight. You know, yeah. like a, it, there, there's a long process to that. It's well, not just flip a switch. I, I need some more. Oh more yeah, rails. I mean, I Go can't if, if if I had the material on on deck. Um, I can't just crap them out. You know, there are other machines do other things than just build receivers or rails or, you know. And and the other part too, kind of going back to what you said, is not not biting off more than you can chew and over leveraging mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. Like if we want to take on massive amounts of debt, we could put more out. But it, 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 that's not the philosophy, or that's not how you built the company. Well, no, and and we're not in the business of collecting parts either. We're not in the parts collection business. Mm -hmm. We're in the business of selling them. And we sell them quick. And unfortunately, we could, we could forecast as much as we can. But I my strategy is to satisfy what I can maturely do financially a market demand and then start the process again, uh, which sometimes takes a while. Hell, we ordered mod two receivers. It took almost a year, more than a year during COVID <laughs> to get, we had an open PO for how long? Yeah. And, uh, we saw it with barrels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had, an, we had open POs for barrels for over a year. And uh, and all that's starting to catch up now, though. If if we drop a PO for a barrel now, uh, it could take up to still 12, 15 weeks before we realize you know those products coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and it could you can say, well, just order more and order more and order more, but that's that's not how we do it. You know, we'll, we'll we'll get our inventory in, we'll exhaust our inventory, and we'll order more. And that way, again, we're not in the parts collection business. Some people have the the ask to do that financially. Um, not that I will, won't ever get to that point. We do maintain some parts, you know, uh, uh, a cachet, as that you would say, but those are typically reserved for folks that because we get it all the time uh send us four of these send us five of these for testing or mm -hmm. this that and the other or a charity event um so we want to be able to make sure we can satisfy those as well but uh, yeah we're in the parts collection business and i don't want to have a constant stream of parts and then all of a sudden do something brand new and then still have an inventory of a half a million dollars of the barrels yeah when I've got a new barrel coming out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. 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 And you don't want to push that off on, on dealers. No. And, no. I, I'll go on a rant on that. I'll, I'll change subject right now. So we, we had a, a question. I put uh, a question up in the group the other day, the Facebook group. And he said, if you could ask Jim Hodge the question, what would it be? And so I've got some here pulled up. I've been scrolling through while we've been talking because I get to listen to this like six times before it ever gets put out. <laughs> I can go back. So if Jim could only have one rifle. I was going to ask that question. That's a good And question. it have one of his barrels, and what caliber and length would it be? I'll go check inventory and see how many we have of one before you answer that. If that if yeah, that what helps. do we need to sell? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you're going to get shot with the 12.5 uh, Mod 2 if you break into my house. Spicy. Um, you know, I, I, I hunt with the 12.5. Um, still, I, I still have an affinity to, to 14.5s. I think that is kind of the do-all um, length or 16. Um, I'm proud of all my barrels. Um, but... You know, if I had to have one, and, and it's the one that, I don't know that we push. Uh, maybe, I mean, I can ask you guys that, but 
you know, the, the most popular thing we see right now with our non-commercial customers is the 12.5. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to realize, I run suppressed. Um, it's, uh, we live in a civilized world now, you know, run suppressed. <laughs> and um, heathens. what we figured out is if you take a shorter barrel, like a 10 and a half inch, 10.3 barrel, and to suppress it really well, you need more of a full-size can. Mm -hmm. Well, the 12 and a half, you can get away with a little bit smaller suppressor, which gives you the overall length of an upper, of a 12 and a half inch upper, but with more dwell time and more rail space. And that's kind of, the 12 and a half is kind of what I'm known for um, in other circles. And... Um, We've, I've only had three, four contracts that were not 12 and a half out of all the other contracts we've had. And um, if I had to pick one, uh, that would be it. There we go. Dan, you owe me for asking that question. <laughs> Jay, uh, Venmo, PayPal, yeah. Cash App. You know, ironically, my personal gun, I think I've, I've told people this before, it's a 12 and a half, but all the parts on it were, hey, I got a scratch here, or hey, this barrel shoots three MOA, and I get the barrel and I shoot it, and it's like, dog, I'm keeping this barrel. This thing is like freaking laser beam. <laughs> and uh, it is it is literally rejects, and it's... It's my gun. Jim's rocking a full blem rifle. I've, yeah. I've, I've, got a, I've got a full blem uh, FCD that I built that's got one of your bar barrels in it that was not a blem. But like that's like the only non-blem piece on the whole gun. Uh, I purposely did that, though. But that's awesome. Yeah, no, yeah. It, my gun is a Franken gun for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's that that right there, the the hodgepodge. I like all the Cerakote. Because um, you like to Cerakote guns or get them Cerakote. Some, sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Um, like I know a lot of your personal ones have have the the hodge colors <sighs> kind of camo, different well, mismatched colors. You know, so the, the you know the gun. Mm -hmm. um, it's there's really one thing that only one thing that Sarah could on. It's got a TI upper on it. It's got a moonrock lower and a blemmed rail. We we coated the the rail because um, it was blemmed and I was okay with the blem, but I wanted to. I, I was testing out a color I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and um, that's where that gun came from. It was, I don't like this. Well, I'll use it, <laughs> and it's like the best shooting gun I've ever built. I think I have a Hodge BCG that came back from returns. Oh yeah, but the guy didn't. There's like a the, the, there's the a scratch clover. on the clover. Yeah, there was a scratch <laughs> on the clover, on the BCG. I was like, all right, cool. I'll take well, that. people deserve what they pay for. I mean, they 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 deserve as much perfection as we can give them. We have stumbled in, in the past. Our BCG thing. I don't think it was a stumble. It, it, you know, people were measuring the keys, saying, "Hey, these are oversized just a little bit," and they were oversized because they were nitrided. Mm -hmm. Typically, keys are chromed on the inside, which adds a little bit of buildup. But, uh, you know, I go back to saying, all right, uh, I haven't had any problems with it. And we've built a lot of guns and um, we've used these carriers for a while um, and didn't really, again, have too many problems with it. I didn't have any problems with it uh, for a while. And then we started seeing a little bit more problems with our BCGs. And just so you guys know, we have, we're going with different BCGs now. Um, and that's, again... Part of the reason why I like my consumer base. I can't look, me personally, even though we now look at everything, it's forced us into that mm -hmm. in the way of, you know, pinning, not for the sake of pinning, uh, but QAQ seeing everything, every part on the gun. Uh, because of the, you guys, um, the consumer base, um, you know, I in the past I I did I'd put a gun together. If it ran, it ran. 
And that's all I really, that's all that mattered to me. And really that's all should, that should matter. But when COVID hit, people were really starting to pay attention to certain nuances of what they considered was the right TDP or spec, which is again from 1984. Um, uh, and we had to, you know, strengthen up our game a little bit um, because of those customers. Well, you take that and you learn from it, and mm -hmm. now we're better because of it. Yeah. So. And I got no shame in my game. And I'll, I'll tell anyone straight up, you know, have I made mistakes? Absolutely. Uh, but we we fix them. And uh, how fast we do it is, is what matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was one of the person's comment. Uh, one question that we had here, uh, what was your warranty like for your rifles and or your or your parts I should say and can you can you sum up we don't have a one year unlimited or anything like that what we have is if you get something that's new and it's messed up and you didn't abuse it or you didn't take it apart and try to put it back together or do this that or the other um, and it comes from us and it's messed up we replace it it's just that simple if it's broke it gets fixed if it's broke it gets fixed <laughs> Now, I can't say after 7,000 rounds down your, we don't have a lifetime warranty on barrels, right? I can't control how you feed that gun. Um, but uh, if you get a barrel that's not right, we replace it. Uh, I was a lot slower in the past because, again, I didn't have the infrastructure of doing that, but I did my best. Um, and... Uh, just fortunately enough, I didn't get a lot of returns because the quality was already built in. <laughs> and the smaller the smaller numbers that you were putting out like back then too helped out. And now you, you do have a little bit of an infrastructure in place. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean. If there is an issue. The parts are, are, are QAQC'd before they get to me. And I would look them over and make sure everything's fine. And um, And at the end of the day, you can take a gun and find a bazillion flaws with a perceived flaws. Let me go back and say perceived flaws in a gun. But once it's assembled and once you've got a, you know, some rounds down on it, um, if that sucker runs, who cares? Really? And you can have a gas port that big. And if it spits what it's supposed to spit, the way it's supposed to spit, suppressed and unsuppressed, who cares? Who cares? Again, we go back to the carrier key. People don't understand it's a high car carbon area. Are they checking the gas tube? Checking the flange on the gas tube? Checking the length of the gas tube? Checking fitment on the on the gas block? There's You start with one thing, you have to compensate for so many other things. And the biggest lesson I've learned in this business is you don't get something for nothing. You got to, not that you have to sacrifice, but you may have to make a change. If you're going to make a small change here, something else probably needs to be changed. And I've, I've said this before in other interviews, it's, it's akin to making spaghetti, you know, um, how I make it is the way I like it. It's good. Right. And if you like my spaghetti, rock on baby cover that stuff all over your face and be like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, if, if it's too garlicky for you, go to someone else's spaghetti. And That's not we're, we're still friends. We're, you know, no big deal. Lots of other great companies out there. Um, but uh, I just hope you like my spaghetti. Now I want spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> That's getting close to time for – well, you all are having crawfish tonight, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, we're we about got to go. Time. We're about to go here and go grab us some crawfish. I'm good any, for another how long? How any long? other good questions in, um, the, in there? I'm scrolling through right now. I know one was um, talking about Sock F and kind of how you got involved with them and kind of. Dave Kramer's been a dear friend of mine for a long time. I met him through a, another mutual friend, Clay Richardson. Oh. And um, we were, uh, when they first started their deal for uh, Shady, um, Dave called me up and was like, hey, man, uh, can you send a gun out? And I'm like, God dang, I don't have any. 
So I went and bought a World War II era 1911 from the Navy, the Navy on the side, and uh, sent that. I wasn't at that one, but every subsequent one other than when my dad passed away, uh, I've been there, um, been honored. Let me, let me back up and say I've had the privilege to be there and been honored to be there to help support a worthy cause and effort. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it touches a lot of lives in a positive way. Um, and, um, I'm all about it. And it's just, it's, it's, uh, when, <laughs> as you guys probably know, folks get hit up and all you other gun manufacturers out there know you get hit up all the time for charity stuff and, it's hard for us to say no, very hard for me to say no. Mm-hmm. But at some point in time, you've you got to pick your battles and say, all right, th- these are my guys. So uh, Hodge Defense is all about S- Special Operations Care Fund and the third option. Mm-hmm. That's our two big ones, third option validation. And you're this last, what, two weeks ago? When you were down there, the uh, six five or six six arc five five six combo upper full gun build that y'all took down there, it went for what thirty five? Forty five. Forty five? Was it forty five or forty eight? Thought it was forty three. It went for a lot. It, it went for it, over forty. It yeah. went for over forty. <laughs> there you go. I think it was the biggest one that they've ever done on silent auction. Mm-hmm. That was a beautiful. Thank you, John Sirkan. Yeah. Yeah. OP Tactical. Um, Yeah. Check them out. OPTactical.com. OP Tactical. So when I was traveling overseas, they're like the OG of internet purchasing. Yeah. John Sirkan has been around for. You'll hear that from a lot of people. Like there's a lot of dudes that have been downrange, um, bought, have been buying from John for day for you know a couple i think he's been around for 20 years yeah something crazy like just i I think i was talking to him at sock i think it's like 20 or 25 years now i ordered some some um outdoor research gloves from him and they shipped it to my apo and i put them on and and i wasn't driving at the time we were just coming back and i'm like hey guys check these out these are super cool i went like this and it split i'm like oh my god so I called John, and he had another set, you know, set sent out to me, like, boom. I didn't call John. I just did it online and kind of wrote him a note about what happened, and boom, it was it. And he got my business from there because of his customer service. Um, Roy Lynn, another kind of an OG uh, dealer of mine um, that has been around a, a, a long time. And, again, talking about a super creative guy, and it's got a good head for business. Uh, it's been wonderful for me. And then you guys, um, we, we you have your dealer network, and I don't know if you want to explain it to the guys, how your dealer network works for, for Hodge Defense stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe that's an, for another time. But, um, yeah, the, the, these are the, y'all are the guys that are kind of my OGs, and without y'all, I mean. But, you know, I wanted to stay with companies that also had high-end product, and they do. <laughs> Uh, and they're not gouging anyone. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely you know we've we've seen. Oh goodness, when when I was still answering customer service emails, that was something you'd see all the time. Was oh, y'all are just flipping this on gun broker. You're <laughs> Did, not. Didn't you get a three thousand, almost three thousand dollars? Somebody offered me mm-hmm. to get them a lower. And I was like, no, man. <laughs> like I'm not risking my job here. What about 3,500, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but like that was one of the things that you always saw that like people would, would miss the drop and they're like, Oh, this, this, this is that. But it, it never was us flipping stuff on gun broker or us None limiting of what we were, you know, or hooking these guys up. It's like, Hey, we've got 25 and t- 24 are going up there. There's one held back just in case UPS loses that one. Yeah. You know? And uh, it's it's definitely been a ride over the last three years with me working here and doing this. Well, you know, it's it's a it's a double edged sword. I, I'm not a fan of the drop culture at all. Um, and we try to give everyone f- fair warning. Mm-hmm. 
Um, There's only so much you can do, though. Yeah. You know, like it, well, I mean, it's, it's it's in the past it was fewer things. It'd be fifty at a time here, or this, that, or the other. But now, I mean, we we drop you know a few hundred rails, and they're still gone in no time. And what do we do? Just order double that next yeah. time? <laughs> no, no, we 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 temper it. Yeah. And it's not a marketing scheme, but it's also, you know, to some degree, if, if I flood the market, then there's no pride in ownership. I, I, I like being exclusive. I like, I, li I like that for my brand. Um, you know, if it's worthy to you and that's how you feel about it. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's pride in ownership and people are willing to pay for it. But I have seen lowers go for north of $3,000 on, Gun broker and uppers go crazy, and it's, things are settling now, which is good. Uh, I, the downside to that is people sometimes look at the brand and say, "Oh, it's just a bunch of snobs," and there's a cult of people. No, no, that's not what I want. I don't want that. I want guys who are into Hodge Defense to be um, ambassadors of folks that are either new to it or I, I, culturally, as a customer base, I can't control anyone. But if I was king for the day, I, I would want all of my customers um, to be super helpful. And that way, oh, he's he's a Hodge Defense guy, but he's super helpful. And he's not going to criticize what I'm doing. And it's okay to buy ABC brand. Um, you know, the... People can do what they can do and when they can afford what they can afford. Um, and their level of need and use is not the same as everyone else's. So if you're a Hodge defense owner, be nice to your fellow gun, gun owners and um, get out and run your guns, man. That's what they're made for. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a good spot. That's, that's for that, no, that's, that's, a good, that's a good note to end on. Yeah. So where can people find you? San Antonio or Dallas or DC <laughs> or Conroe or um, you know the HodgeDefense.com. But if you want product, uh, aforementioned dealers, best. I don't deal direct with anyone. You can ask me. You can message me anytime. I'll do my best to answer your questions. I can't always answer all of them, so uh, you know, just message me. Uh, but uh, for product, go to my dealers. Again, guys, I don't sell direct to anybody. Uh, let you guys do that. <laughs> well, cool. Well, thanks, thanks again for coming on. Um, I hope I didn't sound like an idiot. Just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> that's part of the question. Yeah, this thing. is, I think this is, this is good. It's going to get a lot of people a lot of answers that I think a lot of people have had. Um, answer some really cool questions. I, I learned some stuff. Um <laughs> It's always it's always interesting just to Well, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Or you guys, right? Um now that you're kind of seeing how the sausage is made. Um and you've been in the industry for a long time. Knowing what you know now with with me, uh not as an individual but as a company. Has it changed your perspective on things as far as manufacturing, accessibility, brand management, um, things like that? Is, did, did it open your eyes any on, you know, even product development? Um, that's my question to you. I know speaking for me, it's been a very illuminating experience. You know, I've always been on the retail side of it and the consumer side of it, but being able to kind of peek behind the curtain a little bit into the manufacturing world and, um, you know, the sustainment side of it, that's been very, very illuminating for me. I don't know about, about these two folks. What well, being the, 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 the one thing I didn't know before we sat down in here um, was the, the self-funding of it and you not having any debt towards this is huge. The fact that you're like, okay, you know, I can afford to buy X amount of raw material. 
all right, now I can afford to make that X amount of raw material into X amount of lowers. And now I'm going to sell that and then take that money and reinvest it here instead of, you know, whipping out that AMX card to do it if you had to. That explains so much of it Mm -hmm. from looking on the outside. Because, you know, on the retail side, you know, I've been in retail for a while. It's always like, okay, what can I buy and sell before I have to pay for it? You know, and you don't get to do that with manufacturing. <clears throat> you can't buy it and sell it. Well, you get terms, it. right? So, I mean, if you get a 30, 60, 90 in terms, you can hopefully sell it within the, we wouldn't have no problem doing Yeah, but you're not doing it. that with raw. Yeah, you're but, not doing that with the no, materials. But it's it, correct. But, you know, it's it's a level of. I'm not saying it's the right way to do it. You know, I had a really smart guy tell me, he says, if you really ever want to grow your company, you're going to need an investor. And I spent seven years trying to prove him wrong. He's still right (laughs) (laughs) to some degree. But, you know, I think it'll come, man. And, you know, for all those folks out there, if you do this if you start your own business again i'm not saying it's the right way just try to do it without any debt you know it's what's crippling america to some degree and um you sleep a little bit better at night oh yeah i think my biggest thing was like i've been with these guys for probably two and a half years now and like coming from working at a range coming here like i I didn't know what Hodge defense was until I started here and you know that was during the height of COVID and seeing how you guys have trickled more stuff into the commercial market has been super awesome for I mean it it took me two years to get a a Hodge rifle working here Mm -hmm. and you know that that was because there was you know we would get 20 or 30 uppers at a time and those went those didn't go to any of the people here yeah (laughs) Yeah. that went to hey these are going to the people online you know there there was there was guys i just don't build 20 or 30 we build you know we have yeah yeah yeah, they go to different dealers for sure for sure but i mean during during the height of that it was like hey that you know this was what was released to the commercial market and and seeing you know you can go on, on the website right now and get you know at least barrels, BCGs, you know, there's rails usually here and there. And it's like, just to see your end of it, like through the manufacturing and then through my eyes through, you know, in the warehouse and just how more stuff has come in more frequently and getting out into, getting to the people in the commercial market has been pretty, pretty cool to, to see. Brother, I still get, why can't I get, a, B, C, or D. Hey, I would have people asking me, like, hitting me up on Instagram saying, hey, when are, you know, when's the rail going to come in? I'm like, dude, I don't even know when the fuck the rail is going to come in. Like, <laughs> the boss puts them up, and I put them in a box and ship them out the door. Like, I, I don't have that information you're looking for. You are asking the wrong guy. <laughs> Sometimes but, we don't even know. <laughs> yeah, dude. Sometimes stuff just shows up. Yeah, and, we're like, oh, and that's, I guess I guess this and, is here now. <laughs> and people don't believe that all the time. Oh, right? that PO's fourteen months old. Yeah, <laughs> you know. That, but that's still one of the fun things. Like, I still get a kick out of going back and seeing what dropped off. Yeah. Every day, because you don't know. It's like, hey, well, I can talk about it. The the Unity Axon single lead buttons mm-hmm. came in yesterday, and they're like, hey, Chris, these came in. I'm like. Well, they're not even built yet. So I build them and post about them. And then I'm like, oh, wait, uh, they're not released till tomorrow. So they're going to delete that. <laughs> shit, shit, shit. <laughs> Whoops. But like, it's every day it's something new. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that, and that's the biggest thing is like the, the, the brown truck that drops off stuff. We don't know what comes in sometimes or what is going to be coming in. So oh, it's a Christmas sure. every day here. Well, I, I appreciate everyone being as patient as they can be. And I know I probably lost customers. Uh, because of the lack of quickness with product to the market. Uh, but for those that have waited, sometimes a couple of years mm-hmm. to, to finish their th- oh, yeah. their thing. Uh, we're, thank we're, you. We're going to get comments on here about, <laughs> like, I'm still working on this one. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and, 
And it'll get done. Um, <laughs> it will. Lowers are coming soon. Lowers are coming soon. Oh, yeah, like real, real, real soon. Uh, and more lowers after that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, we're just doing our best to keep our head above water. And we, li we like the air above water <laughs> as opposed to drowning in debt. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, thank you. You bet. For your time. You bet. And if you've listened to this whole entire podcast, you've got any questions or comments, drop them down below or hit us up on our Facebook group. Uh, if you've got questions for next time, because we do see Jim every once in a while, I think he's now accustomed to this. So we'll hopefully have you back. And I know one of the most requested is to get you and Roger in here ah. sometime. But we need like a seven-hour block. Yeah. Yeah, we'll need a lot of time for that one. But we appreciate you tuning in. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.